Hello and welcome to this Union Solidarity International web conference with Dr. Eli Friedman of the Industrial Relations School at Cornell University. Uh, Dr. Friedman is a, an expert on China. Um, welcome, Dr. Friedman. And um, apparently there has been some labor unrest in China um, over the past few years, which is underreported in, in the West. We don't hear a lot about it. Can you give us an idea of, of what's happening? Well, yeah, there's actually been a lot of labor yeah, unrest for more than just the past few years. And if you look at numbers for the past 20 years, they've been consistently going up each year. Um, unfortunately, there aren't any official statistics which are released on the number of strikes, protests, direct actions, things like this. Um, the government reported numbers of what they call mass incidents, which includes worker unrest, but also other forms of protest. Um, they released those numbers until 2005. Um, at which point it became too politically sensitive because the numbers were sort of continuing to go up. Uh, some sociologists from Tsinghua University estimated that uh, last year, 2011, that there was 109,000 mass incidents. And I think a conservative estimate would be uh, a third of those are labor related. So. You know, even if we're talking conservatively, we're still in many tens of thousands of labor-related uh, incidents a year, including strikes, uh, workers going to block roads, there's incidents of riots and things like that. So the volume of labor unrest in China, is, um, it's hard to put an official number or a, a sort of a definitive number on it. But it is certainly an incredible volume and something that is um, way beyond anything that's happening anywhere else in the world, and certainly industrialized countries in the West. Okay. And um, from, from your research, are you able to tell um, a little bit about that, uh, that, that unrest? What is it about? Is it, is it wage disputes? Is it, uh, uh, is it, is it sort of things around civil rights and and who is it that's protesting is it uh, migrant workers uh, what what kind of uh, what kind of uh, what is the nature of the labor unrest what's what's actually happening so this is something which has so changed has somewhat significantly changed. in the past two years so up until you know sometime around the financial crisis 2009 or so Worker protest in China was mostly defensive. You have two, you have two primary groups of workers, which I can say more about if you're interested. Migrant workers who are coming to countryside, to the cities, who are then working in these export processing zones, which making all the things that, that we buy, you know, clothing and electronics and, and stuff like that. Um, they tended to protest mostly over non-payment of wages. Endemic, they don't get paid, you know. And so you haven't been paid for four months, you got to end strike and try to get some more money back. There's another group of workers um, in the stadium sector, and these are urban residents who are working in some of the big state-owned, you know, heavy industry, things like this. And especially from the late 90s, there was um, major redundancies, layoffs, and you know, people's livelihoods major corruption scandals um, and so generally when these when these companies are being privatized or bankrupt or whatever um, that would also generate a lot of protests so both of these instances are defensive in nature, but many people have noticed since around 2010 something of a shift it's not all at once but there's something of a shift taking place where workers and now i'm mostly talking about Migrant workers in private enterprises are going on strike and making awesome demands. We're demanding wage increases above and beyond the minimum wage. Um, and so I think that this is a really promising development, and we're now seeing it in lots of places around the country. Um, now, the, these members, these these uh, workers that are taking action, are are they members of trade unions in, in the way that we would understand them? Not in the way that we would understand them. Um, you know, China has one trade union federation, the All China Federation of Trade Unions, which currently claims a membership. I think their most recent, I think their most recent membership numbers are something like 240 million people. But what it means to be a union member in China is something very different than it would mean in uh, in a liberal democracy. 
most of these people who are officially members of unions probably don't know that they're members of unions. They're not sort of paying dues of their own will. Um, when unions get set up in enterprises, it's an administrative deal where someone from the union goes to management and they say, hey, we'd like to set up a union. Um, Sometimes management, they have had some problems sometimes with management private management enterprises, so sometimes private management is not interested in that uh, and it causes some trouble, uh, but oftentimes they can strike some sort of a deal, the union promises not to cause any problems, um, which they don't, um, and they set up a union, and, um, and then, so on paper, all of those workers will officially be trade union workers. But it's important to know that any time you have an incident of, of unrest or strikes, unions are never leading this. And usually what happens when workers go on strike, they'll first walk out of the factory or whatever workplace they're in, and then they engage in negotiations. And the union is as likely to sort of play a mediator role or even side with management rather than to actually represent workers. So essentially, from from our perspective, what, what is happening is that there are official unions um, that workers are not finding them to be a satisfactory mechanism for uh, resolving their disputes or for representing them. So they're taking what we would call wildcat action. If that if the same kind of thing was happening in, in a liberal democracy, we'd probably call it wildcat action. Right. And then the official unions are responding to that, um, either, as you say, as mediators or um, in, in some way, well, what are they doing? Are they, um, has, it, has it changed the response of the, the official unions? Have they become more representative of worker demands as a, as a result of um, essentially pressure from below? Yeah, so a, a couple of things. The first thing about strikes and whether you know you should consider them wildcat strikes or not. In China, strikes are neither legal, legal nor illegal. There used to be a right to strike in the Chinese constitution which was removed in 1982 on the eve of market reforms. But stri strikes are also not officially illegal. So it's this sort of legal gray area as are many things in China. Um, now, as far as what the union is doing in response, um, you know, you have to analyze the union at two levels. There's what goes on on the shop floor, and there's what goes on at the higher levels of the union federation, at the, you know, the city, the provincial, or even the national level. So the union at the, at the enterprise level, in most cases, is as likely to be directly opposite workers as it is to be helping them in this sort of way. Um, in most cases, enterprise or union federations are chaired by someone from management, most frequently someone from HR. So, of course, their ability to represent workers' interests is, is greatly constrained. Um, another thing which I didn't mention that has changed in the past couple of years is that workers are now demanding to directly elect some of their uh, shop floor level union leaders. And this is not in every strike. It's, but it has happened in some instances, and I think is also a very promising development because it's an indication of the germination of some sort of political consciousness among workers where they say, well, we don't just want more money, we want to have some stake in terms of how the enterprise is run, and we want to have some, some ongoing and institutionalized voice. So I think that's really promising. And there's been a lot of um, progress in terms of uh, direct elections of enterprise level uh, union representatives. But there's a few examples where things have at least gone in the right direction if it's not ultimately satisfactory. Um, on the whole, though, enterprise level unions remain on the side of management. Um, and are not helpful for workers. So then when we leave the enterprise and we look at the federations at city, provincial, or national levels, is the union has been doing a lot more. But what they've been doing is trying to pass new laws, trying to push for new administrative arrangements, in some instances trying to impose collective bargaining agreements and sort of a top-down mechanism. And the way that the ACFTU functions is entirely top-down. That's the only way that they know how to function. Um, so, you know, the, uh, 
best example probably is in uh, 2008, they enacted the labor contract law, which many people saw as being relatively pro-labor. It was very strenuously opposed by the U.S. and the EU chains of commerce. So I think that's a good indication that there might be something worthwhile in there. Um, but the problem with this law and with any of the other laws or these collective bargaining agreements that are sometimes imposed top down is that when you actually get to the enterprise, they're still not enforced because local governments are still aligned with management. Local unions are still aligned with management. And so when it gets to when the rubber hits the road, they kind of disappear into the ether. And so this is really an ongoing problem. And I think until workers have democratic representation where they actually work, that these laws are just going to exist on paper. Has um, the, the worker unrest, is it due to the economy slowing down a bit because of, because of the recession? Um, they're, they're being, um, I, I, I don't know, wage restraint as a result of economic slowdown or they're just being fewer jobs to, to move to if the, the one that you're working in uh, at the moment is, is not satisfactory? Um, no, actually, since um, no, actually, 2008, since when, the when the financial crisis uh, first emerged in the West, uh, <clears throat> well, I should say in the U.S., <clears throat> take full responsibility, um, you know, the impact in, the, in, in China was immediate, and these export processing zones, you know, estimates are that 20 million migrant workers were thrown out of work in the course of just a few months in the fall of 2008, winter of 2009. So then there was a huge amount of unrest as a result of bankruptcies, and there was some pretty sort of spectacular um, confrontations which took place. Um, but since 2009, you know, the Chinese economy has more or less rebounded, not so much on the strength of exports, but because of a massive stimulus package that they enacted in 2009, $586 billion U.S. dollars. Um, so they've been sort of running off that for a while. And the economy has still been sort of humming along. And in fact, what's happening, and this is something that I think a lot of people in the West are surprised by, is that there's been a labor shortage in coastal areas um, where these, most of these export processing zones are. So it's actually a labor shortage, and therefore a market position for workers that has, to some extent, emboldened them and caused them to engage in more strike activity. Um, as a result of this, uh, many enterprises are now leaving traditional coastal areas like Shanghai, Guangdong, uh, these sorts of areas, and moving into the interior, the central and western regions. Um, and some things will be different there. Certainly when they arrive, there's different social and political conditions. Uh, what exactly will be different uh, is you know, still to be determined. Yeah, you um, you wrote an, an, an article, China in Revolt, in uh, Jacobin magazine, and I think in that article you suggested that there was the possibility that um, with the shift of production away from the coast into some of these these other cities, um, workers might become essentially a bit more rooted, um, have have a chance to for some kind of civic citizenship or, or a a sense of political commitment uh, or civic commitment to the place that they live in. Um, the possible impact of this would be um, uh, people engaging in sort of long-term political struggle rather than the, the, the short-term defensive struggles that you discussed earlier about unpaid unpaid wages. Uh, workers essentially having more of a stake in a system uh, where there's a chance that they might stick around longer. And I think you explained that this is because of uh, rules around residency, that a lot of the migrant workers in the export processing zones uh, are not official citizens of the, the cities that they work in, so they they don't really see it as necessary to to fight for um, wider political change in in those areas. Right. Yeah. I mean, the typical pattern for yeah, I mean, you know since the nineteen eighties has been know, this: that migrant workers come from the countryside, they go work in the city. And there's no expectation that they're going to settle down in the city. And the reason for this is there's something in China called, in Chinese it's called the hukou, or it's the household registration system. It means if you come from the country that you're from rural Sichuan province, which is in western China, that's your household registration remains rural Sichuan. If you move then to Shanghai and you get a job in a factory in Shanghai, 
you're not entitled to any of the public services that a, that a local time resident is entitled to. So including, you know, pensions, potential housing benefits, health care, and most importantly, when it comes to uh, sort of the question of settling down and putting down roots, your children are not entitled to going to public schools in your new home. Mm -hmm. And there's variation. Different cities are different, and Shanghai is actually a little bit better than if you move to Beijing. Um, but there are many, there are many administrative, uh, financial, and social obstacles to sending your kids to, to public schools. So the typical pattern has been very young people, you know, 16, 15, 16 years old, leave the countryside, go work in these factories, try to earn as much money as they can until they're, you know, too old, by which you mean, you know, maybe 25, at which point they go back to the countryside to get married, settle down, have a family. Okay, so social reproduction is still happening in the countryside. So there's no, ex you know, there's no understanding, there's no expectation that the cities are their home, that they're supposed to be living there. And they're very they're spatially excluded on the periphery of cities. These factories are usually gated, and so outsiders can't come in, and they spend most of their time just in this factory compound. They're very socially excluded. You know, they, they speak a different dialect, um, and if they try to speak the local dialect, they'll have a, a heavy accent, so they're sort of easily tagged as outsiders. Um, so the city is, there's, there's no idea that you're going to make a life for yourself in the city long term. So, you know, part of what I'm, what I was doing in that article is, is speculation, but it's based on, I think, sort of objective trends which are taking place, which is capital is relocating to the interior. Getting uh, an urban residency in interior cities and western cities, the bar is set a lot lower than it is if you want to get residency in Beijing or Shanghai, where it's, it's actually still quite difficult because you know these cities are huge and they're sort of concerned about it. But if you want to move to interior city, it's a lot easier. So then that raises the possibility, as you said, that you can set up a community, you can put down roots, you can have a family, you can have kids, you send your kids. And so then you can imagine it's not a it's not a quantum leap for workers to say, well not only do I want enough wages so that I can raise a family, but you know, hey, the the schools that, that my my kids are that I'm sending my kids to that are you know close to these industrial zones are really bad schools. So maybe I want better schools. Uh, maybe we want some public housing or things like that. So I think that there's a greater possibility for that once uh, as as more manufacturing is relocating into the interior than was ever the case when it was on the coast. Okay. And um, what do you see happening to the labor movement in, in China? Do you, do you think that these um, worker protests are likely to coalesce into something more solid, uh, a, 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 an independent workers' movement, rather than what they seem to be now, relatively sporadic outbursts of, of protest. Do you think that they're likely to coalesce into uh, an independent uh, political and worker movement? Um, or do you think that there's likely to be some kind of reform of the traditional official trade union movement so that it becomes more democratic and uh, more responsive to, to uh, workers' needs? Or is it, are we likely to see some kind of hybrid or um, a, a combination of, of both those tendencies? I mean, that's the big question. And I, mean, I, I obviously don't have an answer, but you, know, you can speculate a little bit. And the first thing to mention is that you're absolutely right, that there has been a huge volume of worker protests, but it doesn't have the same political meaning that it would in a liberal democracy. Because you, have, you have all of these protests, but they're, they're isolated, right? They're not speaking to each other. And the reason for this is not because workers haven't thought of this, right? The reason for this is that the, the repressive capacity of the Chinese state is just overwhelming. And as soon as you be, the state is relatively tolerant. If you go on strike, and you stay inside your own factory because you're not causing a social disturbance from your perspective. So they're relatively tolerant of that. The second that you leave your factory, you try to coordinate activities between multiple workplaces, or if you were trying to, you know, for instance, make to make education or, or other sorts of public services, then that becomes very threatening to 
then that becomes very threatening. What's going to happen in the future? Well, I, you know, I started you know, out, you know, when, when I started you know, my research on Chinese unions in 2008, being a, optimistic 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 being a lot more optimistic about the possibility that the union might reform itself. After having done more than a year and a half of field work um, on this, I'm pretty pessimistic that the union can reform itself in any way, in any substantial way, in any meaningful way, or in any way which can actually integrate workers with to, within its structures. So I think, but on the other hand, I don't see the Chinese government being willing to compromise on independent union organization at all. I think that they're pretty dead set against it um, because they, they're, they're afraid, and not without any basis, um, that it would pose an existential threat to the one-party rule. And that's, you know, that's the reality. Um, so, I mean, if I had to put my money on, on sort of where things are going in the future, I think that China is actually in for a relatively long period of high levels of worker unrest, of worker insurgency, that does not coalesce into anything more institutionalized, um, which is, from, you know, from a normative perspective, it's not what I would like. You know, I, I, I hope that workers are able to organize, are able to organize, are able to exercise some sort of coordinated political power. Um, but for the time being, uh, again, this repressive uh, power of the state is really just is pretty overwhelming. Uh, how easy is it for Chinese workers to communicate with each other? We hear in the West about uh, control of the internet and, and things like that. How big a factor uh, is, is state repression on, on stopping people from um, communicating? I mean, is it, can, do you have independent labor websites and uh, news services where, where people can find out and, and, and organize, or is that sort of thing not tolerated in China? So there are some labor-related websites so which are based in China and which continue to operate. Um, they have to be pretty tame in terms of the kind of political content that they have on there, but there are some. Um, access to some you know, Western-based um, websites which deal with Chinese labor issues, sites like China Labor Bulletin or China Labor Watch um, are blocked. Um, you know. Mm -hmm. A lot of people in China are pretty internet savvy, and actually, when you're within China, getting to these block websites is not all that difficult if you want to. It's really sort of more of an annoyance than an absolute block. So people can get to them. You know, I think that the more important thing, because migrant workers in China don't actually need to know about, oh, China's violating ILO convention, blah, 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 right? But that's not what they really care about, which is a lot of what you see in these websites. I think what the most important thing for them is, is being able to communicate with each other. Um, and we have seen in protests, uh, strikes in, in the past couple of years, increased use of internet technologies. Um, they have something in China called QQ, which is, um, you know, people can set up chat rooms, yeah, sort of like, you know, MSN or something like that. Um, and they set up chat room, workers will set up chat rooms and sort of discuss issues and, you know, talk about organizing strategies. I mean, these are, the government can monitor them very easily. And, and if, if your chat room gets too big or is associated with uh, a sort of a real life protest, then it can be shut down quite easily. So a lot of times these things are sort of pretty fleeting. Um, but they can use these technologies, and, and they, they are um, potentially effective. Um, so um, Ellen has just written a um, something on the side there. Can you comment on the increasing labor market disjuncture for students, educated youth unable to find white collar jobs, and entering in lower level jobs? Does this create the possibility for a more confident and therefore more resistant tendency in the workforce? Do you expect it might change the quality of self-organization and resistance? Mm -hmm. um, and if I can add something to that, that's a very interesting question because some of the analysis that's come out of the Arab Spring and some of the other unrest has essentially said that there's a new sociological type, which is the, um, the, the underemployed or unemployed graduate, right. uh, that suddenly you have, right. you know, you, you have people with an analysis who um, have who, who are doing sort of low wage work? Are we seeing the same kind of thing in China? 
um, empirically speaking, um, I still haven't seen this. Speaking, but I think that there's some trends in place, um, which may place, which may uh, cause this to be more important trends. And a little bit of background, right? So, 1989, so the pro-democracy protests um, in China, which involved a lot of students. It also involved a lot of workers, which you also hear about in the West. But you know, certainly there was a lot of students. And you know, they come in, they kill all the people in Tiananmen. The deal of the Chinese state strikes with students essentially after 1989 is you stay out of politics, the economy is going to grow. If you get into a good university, you're guaranteed a good job and you're guaranteed a ticket to the emerging middle class. And that, that deal worked pretty well you know, until, until 2008. But at the same time, the Chinese state is massively increasing their investment in higher education, which, you know, I'm not opposed to, which you know, is a good thing. But to a certain extent, you do begin to have overcapacity. Um, and so you have a lot of college graduates and not necessarily the kinds of jobs um, that they would have expected. Right? It's not 1997 or something anymore. So, um, so. Um, so you are going to have more so more people have who more have college degrees, degrees, who have the anticipation degrees, of getting white collar jobs and entering the middle class that are not going to be able to realize that. that now, what exactly they do with that is not totally clear to me. Um, you know, I think most Chinese students for a long time um, would they sort of have this I, this idea sort of this again, which you know you work hard, you stay on the right path, and you can get ahead. This is this is your ticket to the middle class dream. Um, another I think reason for optimism is that you know I spend a fair amount of time on, on Chinese university campuses, and I think that, that the students there have become a lot more politicized, especially since 2008, right? Because the financial crisis. Sort of, I mean, weirdly in China, they have a lot of admiration for, for the U.S. and for U.S. style capitalism. And I think that 2008 sort of reveals to them, like, hey, you know, actually the free market can't solve all your problems. Um, and so since that time, there's been I think, a major uptick of, of student, calling it student activism might be a bit of an overstatement. I mean, there is some stuff happening. Um, but students who are interested in politics, students who are interested in labor issues, um, some students here and there who are going to work in factories. So, so, you know, I don't have a good answer to the to to this question. I disability exists. I think that a lot of them are going to have to take bad jobs, um, and you know, we'll have to see. Um, yeah, sorry, one this, last one last thing on that, um, because you said at the beginning it's sort of a comparison to the to the Arab Spring, and do you have this new sort of sociological category of underemployed and, and highly educated people? Uh, I think absolutely that. Yes, I think the Chinese government is very concerned about it, um, and there was a few attempts at sort of Jasmine style protests in China, which the state clamped down on very hard. <laughs> And in fact, went so far as to ban the sale of jasmine flowers at a flower market in Beijing because they were concerned about it. Um, to, to take you back to your question, Earlier in the conversation, um, you, you spoke about how um, the official unions have been enforcing collective agreements and uh, and uh, things like this. In some instances, as a response to worker unrest, is this having the effect of generally and slowly raising wages and living standards among working people in China? Yeah, I mean, you know, a lot of times you yeah, see I mean, this you know, sort of alarmist reporting in, uh, in reporting the Western media, I mean, especially The Economist or, you know, Financial media, Times, place like this, sort of, I just saw one of these old headlines the other day, it said, the end of cheap China, right? So they're very concerned, wages are going up and this is going to, this is going to be a big problem. Um, for all these, all these Western companies that are sourcing for ridiculously cheap from China. Um, so wages are going up, absolutely. Um, so wages are going up, absolutely. Local, local governments, uh, minimum wages in China are set at the municipal level, but they've basically been told by the central government to increase um, wages, and wages have been going up. I mean, estimates vary, but certainly double digits a year. Um, and 
in the last couple of years, it seems like wages have finally outpaced, uh, rising wages has finally outpaced inflation. So there's actually real wage increases which are taking place in coastal areas. Part of that is simply labor market dynamics. As I mentioned, there's been a labor shortage in these coastal areas, and so you've got to pay more if you want the workers to come. Um, you know, there's another way of thinking about what's going on uh, with the labor shortage, which is in a situation in which there are no independent unions and you can't go on strike, that the sort of individualized form of strike where workers are saying, well, we're just not going to take these jobs anymore, it's not worth it. Um, and that's, to some extent, one of the few forms of, of action that they have. Um, so, yeah, so, so wages are going up, for sure. Um, you know, if you were, again, to read The Economist, you might think that uh, it's, it's a great job suddenly to be a Chinese worker. This is not the case. Uh, and if, if you look at, you know, over the past 15 years, in, in relatives, migrant worker salaries have actually fallen further and further behind um, white collar workers and other sorts of professionals. Um, so, yeah. I, I think that's yeah. that, that's, I, I think that's sort of the best way to respond to that question. Okay, so it, it sounds like it, it's quite a slow process, but one which uh, the labor movement um, in the rest of the world would probably welcome. Um, right. Firstly, right. because obviously it's you know it's good to hear about anyone getting paid decently for something, but also because China and India are used as the stick to beat us all with. You know, the reason your factory is closing in, in the US or the UK or South Africa or wherever it is, is because workers in China and workers in India are cheaper. And um, I suppose we, we hope that um, if there's a long-term tendency towards wages rising in, in China, that maybe that is less of, of, of an incentive for, for shifting production in future. And that um, hopefully there's it can be the beginning of, of um, us being able to arrest the race to the bottom uh, momentum that we've seen. If there's, if there's nowhere else to go for absolute bare bottom um, cut price labor, um, do you think that, that that is possible or do you think um, something else will happen that the, the, the Chinese currency will be devalued further to make the, the value of the, uh, the wages different or, or, or even that... Um, production might be shifted elsewhere to, I don't know, through Chinese investment in Africa or, or to somewhere else in the economic periphery? Right. That's a great question. Um, right. It's a great first, question. The, uh, something you said a little bit earlier was this question about, like, oh, you know, it's, it, this is a, a sign of optimism, right? And we, it'd be great if we had this problem uh, in the West. And, and I think it is interesting, you know, on, on the one hand, China is really cause for pessimism because you say, because you see a situation in which workers are not allowed to organize, there's no independent unions, there's no right to strike, all of these things. But we have all of these things in the West, and it doesn't seem to help, right? I mean, American workers go on strike very infrequently, and when they do, there was just a, a large strike uh, with, with Caterpillar, the, the construction um, company, and it was a defensive struggle, and workers lost, right? So it seems like, in the U.S. anyway, the unions yeah, can't even way. win defense yeah. struggles. If you want a defensive struggle, it's a victory. In China, on the other hand, you know, I, I think it is cause for optimism to some extent. You know, workers, despite facing, you know, incredible risk, possibility of violence, imprisonment, and all this stuff, they're going on strike, they're winning, they're getting big wage increases, and they're getting, I think, in some areas now, wages are going up in real terms. So this is, this is good news. Um, as far as the question of the, the race to the bottom, and does this mean that wages are going to go up so much in China that um, we can preserve more manufacturing jobs uh, you know, in wealthy countries? Um, I think that, that may begin to be a factor. I mean, you know, different industries operate different ways. I think, um, and I think for certain industries, it will now make sense to, to keep manufacturing, manufacturing closer to home. I mean, it would be better to not have the sort of convergence where wages in rich countries have to come down so much. And if you look at the, you know, what's going on in the U.S. auto industry, of course, wages have, have 
wages and benefits continue to go down and actually now it's not that much more expensive to produce autos here than it would be uh, in China. Um, as for whether invest, you know, whether investment is going to go from China to, to even poorer countries, I think some of it will, some of it already is, but that's mostly going to be the low capital intensive, labor intensive industries, you know, textiles, apparel, maybe toy manufacturing, this kind of stuff. Some of it is moved to Vietnam or to Cambodia. Um, whether whether Sub-Saharan Africa is viable for these things at this point, I'm not, I'm not sure. You know, but China is moving up the value chain, and they have these really incredible agglomerations. I mean, if you look at the development of the auto industry in the Pearl River Delta, I mean, you know, it's like Detroit was a generation ago, where it's not just you have auto assembly plants, you have the whole supply chain is organized there, and so you have your, you have your parts, you know, your parts manufacturers with your, with your assembly plants, and and once you have that kind of industrial agglomeration, it's incredibly expensive to move it to other places. So even if your wages go up, um, even if they double, right, it, it may still be worth it for you to keep it there. Um, so it's going to be different in different industries. So it's going to be different in different industries. Okay. Eli, you said you had until uh, 11 o'clock uh, New York time, and it's four minutes away. So. Um, I'm going to say uh, thank you very much for your time. That was really insightful um, and you, you're clearly very knowledgeable about a subject area and a geographical area which is fairly dark to a lot of um, union activists in, in, in other countries. We, we don't actually get a lot of analysis out of China. So I've certainly found it really helpful to, to get that, that kind of insight and I'm sure our, our listeners and viewers will, will have the same experience. So, you know, thanks, thanks again for um, agreeing to, to, to share some of your insights with us. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Um, yeah, you know, I obviously having, think uh, that China is yeah, a really important country. I think, um, as opposed to 10 years ago, uh, I no longer have to explain to people why China is important or, or why you should care about it. Um, there is this problem where it's, it seems sort of mysterious and difficult to figure out what's going on there or how um, you know, labor activists in the West should think about engaging with China. It's a, it's a difficult process, it's difficult to figure out, but you know, I think that it's really important to have the conversation. So thanks very much for, uh, for starting it.